What is up, everyone? Welcome into DNVR Rams Late Night. I'm Justin Michael. This is an extension of our DNVR Rams podcast presented by Chevalier Mortgage. We're talking about a beatdown, a 36-7 beatdown for CSU at New Mexico. That's 11 in a row. They more than cover the spread. It was just, it was total domination. I mean, this was this was a game that it probably should have been, it probably should have been a shutout. I mean, New Mexico's only touchdown comes via special teams on a punt return. A rare kind of poor punt from Stonehouse. It wasn't awful. It was just a little bit of a of a low line drive. Um, it was, you know, it, it just gave him an opportunity to break the kick and that's unfortunate, but it's tough to be upset about a 36-7 victory. All things came up CSU in this one. I mean, 452 total yards to 69 total yards for New Mexico. This was just an absurd disparity in this game. And and really, I mean, when you consider the fact that Caden Camper had five field goals in this one, this very easily could have been you know, like a 50, 60 point night for CSU, you know, it was, it was really that type of beatdown. you know, it could have been like 50 to zero, which is crazy. I mean, it's crazy that CSU has been able to just consistently dominate New Mexico. Now, obviously there've been some close ones. History says that this game tends to be, you know, a three point game or a blowout and rarely, rarely ever anything in between, but I don't know. I just, I was really impressed with the way the Rams came out tonight. I thought this was a big prove it game for them. It felt like a little bit of a trap game, just in the sense that you're coming off of a really high moment after absolutely dominating San Jose state, the way that the Rams were able to do at home last week. And you're going against a team, true freshman quarterback, you'd beaten them 10 straight times. Like that's classic letdown opportunity and CSU. They took care of business. Now, it wasn't perfect. We'll get into that, you know, too many, too many penalties. We got a great comment here from Nicholas Toffelmeyer. I hope a freshman quarterback gives a top 40 defense bulletin board material every week. And I'll, I'll talk about that more later, but that, that was wild. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the situation, Montez, the uh, true freshman quarterback for New Mexico, he said some wild stuff before this game, just being like, we're going to blow them out. We're going to be able to run all over them. That didn't happen. 69 total yards. That's the second uh, least allowed amount of yards by a CSU team ever. Just absurd. I got a good comment here. Rams need to get a touchdown in the red zone. Yeah, we'll get into all of that. The red zone in general, I mean, it's, it's left a lot to be desired. I think they've gotten a little conservative at times. I don't hate it. I just, you got to be able to score some points there. There's going to be a game this year where if CSU continues to rely on the field goals, it's it's really going to come back and and bite them in the butt. I mean, you got to be able to capitalize, but again, 36, seven win. How do you really feel that upset about that? I mean, it it was domination and in every sense of the term, Uh, before we keep the instant reaction going, I do want to shout out our friends over at Chevalier mortgage. Their ultimate goal is to take the stress out of buying and refinancing. If you have natural equity in your home, and if you have mortgage insurance, chances are you can refinance out of that. Make the bubble work for you. You know, if you're in the buyer's market, it's a crazy process out there right now. I mean, buying a house in Colorado, it's it's just absurd. It's the wild, wild west. Let Mike and Virginia Chevalier take the burden off this extremely difficult process. They're going to alleviate so much stress. Take some of that worry off your plate. They actually have a fun perk for DNVR members. If you go to dnvrmortgage.com, you can enter to win a free DNVR shirt or hat of your choice. Most of all, you are going to get set up with a free consultation to discuss all your options. That's dnvrmortgage.com. We have so much love for them. If you want to call Mike directly, you can at 970-412-2472. Michael Chevalier, NMLS number 1931006. Virginia Chevalier, NMLS number 1910631. Word. Uh, let's keep the instant reaction rolling, though. Uh, like I said, I mean, the the story of this one was definitely the defensive dominance. Anytime you can hold an opponent under 100 total yards, not 100 rushing yards, which is one of my keys to victory. One of my keys to victory, hold them under 100 yards. They did that, and then some. They actually hit all of my keys to victory in this one. Own the third quarter, 
uh, win the turnover margin, spread the ball around. They were able to do all of those. Um, I, I like the way that this game played out just in a sense that they got challenged early and then they stepped on the throat, you know, and, and those were two things that the Rams struggled to deal with early in this season. You know, when it came to those tight games where you can't really pull away, you're only up six at halftime after that punt return. And it's starting to feel, you know, a little bit like the Vanderbilt game in a sense where it's like, Oh man, we completely dominated them in every single aspect of that half. And we're only up six, you know, a touchdown, they would have been down. And that's why the turning point was so important. We'll get into that in a little bit, but, um, I just, I like the way that the offense is moving the football right now. Again, you know, the red zone execution, it's not great. You want to score more touchdowns. You want to get the ball to Trey McBride if you can. It was good to have David Bailey back. I mean, other than Caden Camper, Bailey's definitely been CSU's most consistent red zone weapon this year. He's been really effective in the swing pass game. He's been effective between the tackles. And one thing that I want to bring up in this one, I mean, the Rams were pretty effective offensively, and you're going against a challenging defense. Rocky Long, one of the most underappreciated coaches in the country, is vaunted 3-3-5 defense, 4-2-5. They just they run so many looks at you. They do a lot of weird pre-snap movement. They tend to really, you know, get pressure, and they were able to do that a little bit tonight. And CSU's offensive line, it's it's starting to get banged up a little bit. I mean, they don't have Pakazi. Uh Koritz went down in this one, so stretched a little bit thin. That's a factor that we're going to have to kind of consider moving forward. But all things considered, I just feel like it was a pretty good offensive showing. Again, red zone ex- red zone execution needs to be a little bit better. You need to be able to score a few more touchdowns when you have those opportunities, especially like when you get a turnover and you take the ball in, in plus territory. Those are the situations where you really have to capitalize. But I mean, CSU, they dictated the pace. They completely dominated in terms of total plays ran you know they were really effective on third down all of these things are winning football that's all sustainable and and i like that and so again while you can nitpick and you can be like man they've got to score more touchdowns and they do when you look at the way that they're driving consistently between the 20s a it just seems to me like they're they're really starting to figure out their identity now you need to be able to execute when when the defense is tight and and you have those opportunities, but I'm just encouraged, man, especially when you consider Todd Santeo second consecutive week, I thought where he was just really effective. It it wasn't perfect. He did have a couple of missed throws. He also had some really, really important plays in this one in particular on third down. I thought he was really impressive. They drew up a couple of QB uh, keeper situations where they would spread it out, give him an empty set, kind of just let him read the defense. And then, see what the defensive line go- does and, and just go straight up the gut. He's a big dude. He's hard to take down in those situations. And he's good at using his downfield blockers. That's one of the things our film room guy, Jake Schwanitz, you know, early in the season, he was like, Santeo's really effective in those running situations. I'd like to see them do more design QB runs. He was great on those tonight. He had a couple of really big, important throws on third down where he was able to evade the pass rush you know, step up in the pocket, make a strong throw downfield. That's the difference, you know, like that's the difference between winning football and losing football. And those were the plays that he was not making early in the season. And he was able to do so tonight. I mean, 16 to 25, 289 had that uh, touchdown to Gary Williams late in the, in the second half, just solid, just solid all around you'd like to run the football a little bit better than you did as a team. I thought Santeo was effective, but you know, I thought they, they left a little bit to be desired, at least on the ground game. Part of that probably just has to do with, you know, they're, they're mixing and matching so many pieces on that offensive line. Hopefully they're able to get it together. Hopefully they're able to get a couple of these guys healthy. And uh, I'll get to some questions at the end of the podcast. that we've gotten on Twitter. People can comment with your questions as well. Thank you to everybody that is, uh, active and, and on the stream tonight. This is it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun seeing CSU turn it around. And, you know, they they have an opportunity to be relevant in Mountain West play. And that's really all you could ask for, especially after an 0-2 start to the season with both of those losses coming at home. Everyone's hitting the panic button and, and they've really responded well over the last four or five games. Um, Trey McBride, you know, he was awesome as always tonight. 
just just a really solid defensive showing and it's so weird for me and I, and I talked about this a little bit last week it's so weird to have a CSU team that's just so consistent defensively where you feel like on a week to week basis they are going to come out and they're going to bring the fight they're going to punch you in the mouth they're going to play you know fundamentally as talented and, and as aggressive as they are and, and they laid the wood tonight there were a couple of really big hits Henry Blackburn in particular was awesome. There were a couple other ones too, but while they're aggressive and, and they're making plays and they're flying around the field, they're also playing gap sound. You know, they're they're not trying to do too much. And that was one of the things that Scott Patchen brought up. You know, nobody has to be Superman on this defense. They just have to do their job. And that's really what's allowed them to be successful. It's just doing the little things. We got a question from Nicholas Toffelmeyer here. Uh, biggest crowd in Canvas history for the Boise game if we beat Utah State. I would like to hope so. I mean, I said it last week. If you win these next two, that should absolutely be a sellout. We'll see what's happening. Boise State and Air Force coming down to the wire. It's late tonight. We'll we'll go over the rest of the league. But yeah, I mean, why not? You, you started the season slowly. And as it stands, you're leading the Mountain Division. I mean, if you win out, you would go to the Mountain West Conference Championship game and and none of what happened in non-conference play would have mattered. You know, the the slow start, obviously at that point, you're probably kicking yourself thinking, man, if we didn't blow that Vanderbilt game, you know, maybe we're going to gonna be in a big national bowl or something. But at this point, I think the goal just has to be to, to reach the postseason. And right now, that is a realistic target for this team. It's going to be tough. We're getting to, <laughs> as tough as the beginning of the slate was. The, the conference schedule is about to get real brutal. This trip to Utah State's not easy, but you know after that, Boise State, Air Force, Wyoming, that three-game stretch is, is never fun. And then you still got to go to Hawaii, which is always just wonky given the kickoff times. And it's a weird atmosphere, and you worry about jet lag. And then, obviously, you close out against Nevada, who's one of the best teams in the league. But we'll see what they have to play for at that point. I mean, that could be a situation where CSU needs their sixth win, or maybe they need their seventh or eighth win. We'll see. And if Nevada doesn't have a whole lot to play for, like if it's clear San Diego State is going to go to the Mountain West Championship game, then you know maybe CSU wins a weird one at home in the cold. It's going to be a November night game. I like the way this is playing out. I like where CSU is sitting right now. And I just, I like that they have an identity on both sides of the football. Again, it's it's not perfect on offense. They They got to execute better in the red zone. You know, we still need to see Santeo deliver in the passing game more consistently down the line. Um, but I, I think with the way that they're running the football, at least, you know, especially early in the games, they're kind of facing some stack sets here in the second half of these ones after they get up. But it's very encouraging. It's very encouraging the way Santeo's making smart decisions with the football. They're finally connecting on some stretch plays. And you have a kicker that you can trust. Like, yeah, it sucks that they're not scoring touchdowns, but I cannot stress to you enough just how rare it is in college football to have a kicker that you can completely trust. And that's what Caden Camper is. He has made it look like that weird showing against Vanderbilt, the one of four start in those first two weeks in total was a total fluke. He did miss one today, but five of six. Again, we're, we're picking at straws here. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be upset about that, but I want to talk about the turning point in this one. Uh, so let, let's go ahead and move on to that next segment, the turning point. The opening drive of the third quarter to me was what really flipped this game. At that point, you have a six point lead. You possess the ball, you know, you receive in the second half and you come out six plays, 75 yards, two minutes and 45 seconds. And you cap it off with a David Bailey touchdown run. I just think that was the play where it was like, yeah, this is close. We've let you hang around, but it's time we step on the throat. And that's that's what the Rams did in the second half. They forced two more turnovers, finished plus three in the turnover margin today. Really excellent. And, and, and just a big momentum play. Like, if you win the third quarter, a lot of the time, it's obviously not a guarantee, a lot of the time, you're going to be able to win the game because it means you're adjusting better on the fly than them. It means you're probably controlling the matchup going into the fourth quarter. Now, again, numbers can be de deceptive if you're down 30 or something and then you win the third quarter 10-0 and you still lose, you know, 50 to 10 or something. That that can happen. But 
a lot of the time, especially in a tight game, the third quarters are really an indicator of who's going to come out on top. And it had been that way for CSU. They'd they'd held their opponents to zero points in the games they'd won. It was, and they'd been outscored a bunch, like 42 to zero in the games that they'd lost in the third quarter. So I just, I think, I think that was the the turning point in this one. And Steve Adazio and, and David Bailey, they both mentioned it post game as just kind of that transcendent moment where the game started to change. Got a comment from Nick Reese here. Crazy that there's a possibility the Ram Falcon trophy might determine the mountain division. It very well might like, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves again. Utah State, Boise State, these next two weeks, we're going to learn a lot about CSU. How do they respond? You know, now you're 500 for the first time this season. You control your own fate, which is a position that CSU has not been in since 2017. Um, so again, you know, we don't want to get, we don't want to start feeling ourselves too much. But they got a shot. There's no reason to believe that the Rams aren't at least going to be in the conversation based on what we've seen in Mountain West play. And especially if you look at the things that they did well in non-conference play, I mean, they're a bad third quarter away against Vanderbilt from being four and two right now. And if they were, I just, I can't help but think how different the the complete tone of the fan base would be. I mean, even so, I think people are still skeptical, especially with the, the lack of touchdowns in the red zone and, you know, letting UNM hang around for a little bit. I think people are, are still a little bit skeptical and that's fair, but I just, I think they're playing a solid brand of football. And, and in, in that second half, especially starting with that first drive, that that touchdown drive, I felt like they took the air out of UNM at that point. And it was just kind of like, yeah, you know, you've been in it, but it, it's clear that one of these teams is significantly better. And because of that, my DraftKings king of the game goes out to David Bailey. CSU's running back. Good to have him back out there. There were actually no uh, photos available on USA Today from tonight's game. That's why we had to use a different one. But shout out to my main man, Yahir, for that dope graphic. 21 carries, 58 yards, two touchdowns. I thought about giving it to Caden Camper. Another 15, uh, 17 points, I guess, tonight. 15 points off field goals. Uh, two points off the extra points. But I just think David Bailey's so important. It wasn't the the most explosive night in the world. Again, I think some of that had to do with what UNM was running against them in the second half and, and being a little bit thin along the offensive line. But just having a running back that you can lean on, and, and, and especially in the red zone, you know, getting back to it, I know we're kind of beating a, beating a dead horse here, but he's been so solid, and it was really good to have him back. Uh, Jack Bailey, CCU was at the point where I think they could beat CU. I'm pretty confident. Yeah, I mean, that was posed to me on Twitter. And, and I know we're kind of all over the place tonight with me answering questions and, you know, keeping it going. But I think this is a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. You know, keep comments and I'll keep answering. Um, you know, I I don't want to always compare CSU to CU as a determinant of whether the Rams are relevant or whether they're good or not. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think CSU would beat CU right now. I'm confident saying it. But also, I'm just kind of like, who cares about them? Yeah, they shut out. They shut out Arizona today. They're probably not going to win another game for the rest of the year. So right now, I think the focus just needs to be on CSU. And I, I can get wrapped in, up in this as well. Especially, you know, everybody at DNVR, there's a lot of Buffs people. You know, when the Buffs are winning, they're letting me hear it. And, you know, my whole life, I've had to deal with the whole, you know, CU fans walking around like we're not worth their breath. You know, CSU not even worth their time of day. You know, the lowly little brother, lowly little Rams. But again, they, they've got their own shit to deal with. And um, they got a win today. I'm glad for Henry. But, you know, they're, they're going to be watching a lot of other teams while they're sitting at home. And so we can just kind of let them have their misery. And we can just kind of enjoy our good moments. That's the way I'm going to look at it. I am going to try and bring up CU as little as possible for the rest of the season. Legitimately. Because who cares? Who cares about the Buffs? They didn't want to play CSU. They're going to win two games, maybe three if they're lucky. They're completely irrelevant in the Pac-12. And we can play other big teams. Like I, At the end of the day, I always would rather have a Rocky Mountain showdown because I think that rivalry is good for the state of college football. I think it's good for just keeping people interest, you know, general interest levels in, in both schools and the rivalry as a whole. But since they're going to play that way and, you know, act like they're too good for CSU, you know, let them be irrelevant and let's let's not even waste our breath on them. Let's flip the script. 
Speaking of uh, DraftKings Sportsbooks, though, since we just gave out the DraftKings King of the Game, another week of the NFL season means another shot to win big at DraftKings Sportsbook. They are an official sports betting partner of the NFL. And this week, if you bet $1 on any NFL game, you can win $100 in free bets if either team scores a point. Flat 0-0 tie. That was in 1943, so it's a no-brainer. DraftKings customers can also get some skin in the game with the same game parlay. Combine multiple bets for a same game and a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. Safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your money whenever you want. Download the top rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code DNVR when you sign up. Bet on any NFL game this weekend. Win $100 in free bets if either team scores a point. That promo code DNVR this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, Colorado only. New customers only. Restrictions to apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. And if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. All right. Sorry about that. Allergies are absolutely killing me. Been so phlegmy lately. I don't know about you guys. Not a lot of fun. Um, Yeah, man, this was just dominant. And and we're going to talk about the the rest of the Mountain West. We're going to get in to really this whole game. Uh, But I want to play broods for you because there there's just a lot of good to talk about in this game if you're unfamiliar this is a hypothetical exercise i want to make that really clear um i'm really worried about that eric always makes fun of me because he's like who cares it's just a game but it gets all weird with the ncaa you know people being legal drinking age and all that regardless i'm starting with the broadcast crew this they get no duel This was a terrible, terrible broadcast. The commentators were fine. It had nothing to do with the the TV, you know, the play-by-play guys. Shout out to my guy, Sed Bonner. The cameras, man. The first play of the game, they lose it in the glare, and I'm just sitting there like, are you kidding me? There's high school broadcasts that have better production value than this. It was really disappointing. Really disappointing. The fact that you're a division leader, and, and... You want to know who else gets an O'Doul? The Mountain West and Craig Thompson for not going to their TV partners. There's not even a football game on FS2. It's like a dog thing. And this game is on Watch Stadium. I'll give them credit. It got better as it went on after a really rough start. Early on, I was like genuinely pissed off. I was like, I I can't believe that this is what this game is going to be on. But man, can we get it together, please? Please, like, there are high schools in Texas that would be laughing at the Mountain West for the quality of that broadcast. And I'm not trying to, like, throw a tantrum or anything like that, but it's true. It's just embarrassing. It's a bad look for the Mountain West. And to me, it's it's a perfect example of, I'm glad that they had this deal with Fox Sports, but you should also have a regional deal. Why is AT&T Sportsnet out on the Mountain West now? You know, this is perfect when you have like a drew goodman game let him go down to albuquerque watch it on tv i just i don't maybe there's more eyes on stadium than putting it on a regional network but i I have a hard time believing that um but let's get back to the positive because again this was domination and it was awesome just really team performance like in, in all levels the secondary played well the front seven was well the defensive line the linebackers everybody stepped up I am going to give a pint, though, just kind of just starting at the bottom and and working my way up just to everybody in the secondary as a whole because it was such a brutal start for this unit, guys. It, uh, Man, there there were moments when they got flagged for like eight pass interference calls, and it wasn't actually eight, but you know what I mean, in that Vanderbilt game where I was just like, this is going to be the longest season They've had to rely on some young guys. They've had to battle through some injuries. They're forcing a lot of turnovers now, though. And that's really, really encouraging. And then, you know, on top of that, while everyone in the secondary gets a pint, a member beer from my guy Logan Stewart makes a big play in the New Mexico game, comes up with the second half interception. Just awesome, man. He's a good dude. One of the best stories on the team. A humble guy. I mean... He's lost a lot of minutes, one, because he's been injured, but two, because Henry Blackburn and and Jack Howell have been so good. It's hard to be that veteran that kind of has to play the leader role, 
and sees his you know sees his minutes reduced, but still steps up when he has an opportunity to make a play. He did that, and that was really great to see. Um, I also have got a member beer for Sir David Bailey in the backfield. You know, two touchdowns. How do you not give him a member beer after that? Really, really solid day. Um, you know, CSU, it's it's their entire offensive identity is predicated on being able to run the football successfully. And and they really are gonna need him to to take some quality carries for this team down the stretch to be able to score when they get in the red zone and just take some of the pressure off of Todd Santeo because when you're able to do that, it opens things up in the play action, you know, it creates opportunities to attack vertically. It just everything works better when this run game is going and I'm very encouraged. Obviously, we hope that Ajon Vivens is okay. Left that one with an ankle injury. Actually got carted off the sideline. We don't have an update on his status as of yet. He looked so good these last couple of weeks, though. So really hope, really, really hope that that he's okay. We have got a pint for Todd Santeo. I meant to do that before I went under the member beers. He was solid today. You know, it wasn't perfect, but he did what he needed to do. And and honestly, you want to know, we'll give him a member beer because. Again, when, when you face the type of criticism that he faced early in the year, to be able to respond the way that he has these last two weeks, that's significant to me. I mean, it's clear why why this team rallies around him. It's clear that he has leadership characteristics that this team just responds to. Is it perfect? No, but it's what this team needs right now. And I hope all these people clamoring for a QB change and, and wanting to go to a true freshman they, they look at what's happened with CU this year. They look at what happened to this true freshman quarterback for New Mexico, and they get it through their heads that that's a really tough position to be in. The grass is not always greener on the other side. That's you know my main point in this. We have got a member beer for Mr. Scott Patchen. Three tackles for loss, two sacks, absolutely wrecking shit in the, in the trenches. He has been so solid. Oh, man, we got a live update. Boise State... Oh. Does anybody recover more onside kicks than Boise State? 47 seconds left in the fourth here. I'll throw it on in the background here. Um, that's not a very good broadcast. So I'll just I'll see what happens after. <laughs> Dang. I hate when there's a good game. That's how it goes, though. Sometimes that's how it is. Um, Henry Blackburn, though. Seven total tackles as well. Four solo. Had the, the biggest hits of the night that I can remember. I mean, he... He was money in this one. He was really money. And it's encouraging to see guys like him and Jack Howell stepping up, making plays. That looks terrible. I'm going to shut it off. Um, they're going to need them to do do it more down the line. And it's just been one of the biggest bright spots for CSU. We have got a beer tower for Caden Camper. Five of five. I mean, or excuse, technically missed one. Five of six. His, his streak ended, but the dude's just been so money for CSU all year long. And being able to rely on your kicker in the college game, it's so rare. Like, I, I genuinely hope that people understand that. You know, I'm going to beat a dead horse there, but it's true. Trey McBride also getting a beer tower. Seven catches, 135 yards, led the team. And every major, you know, receiving category just continues to be the biggest piece of this offense. I mean, it takes like three Lobos to bring him down every time he has the ball. The guy's just a stud in every single aspect. Go get his t-shirt on the dnvr.com. All right, let's let's wrap it up here. And and let's talk about... I wanted to go around the Mountain West, but since this Boise State game is not over yet, I guess I'll just save that conversation for tomorrow. And I'll, I'll go to some, some questions before I kind of give my final thoughts on this one here. I, I've got a couple of questions here about Dante Wright. If you look in the stat book, he gets credited with a catch. I believe that was Justice McCoy. So I think that's an error. You know, I think he's got a, a lower body injury. I don't want to put it out there exactly what he's dealing with, but he's he's going to have to kind of get eased back in the lineup. Now, I think he would have liked to have seen him back at this point, but nice. Air Force wins against Boise State. Yeah, that changes everything, guys. What what motivation does Boise State have coming into that CSU game? I'm I'm really looking forward to talking about that down the line. Thank you for the updates, everyone. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to see Dante Wright. I'm also kind of glad that they didn't have to show something that they'd been dialing up in practice in these blowout wins. You know, that that was pointed out to me by my, by my good friend, Marty Lenz. Yeah, 
you'd like to see CSU take some more shots. And that's even something that Steve Adazio mentioned post game. You also want to save a little bit. You know, you don't want to put too much on film. Air Force, that game's looking huge. Boise State, you know, you'd still want to beat them for the first time. You don't want to give away too much. I mean, you're controlling this one. I I kind of understand why they went somewhat conservative. I mean, they still threw the ball. I don't know. I liked it. I, I really liked it. But they, they do need Dante Wright. And I think that getting him back, it, it'll help just all aspects. I mean, he's the type of guy that you can put points on the board with. Um, so, yeah. I had a couple different guys ask about that, so I just wanted to address it first. Got a question from Brian Head here. Will Ryan Stonehouse be a six-round pick of the Broncos? I hope so, man. He's better than what they are currently working with. I will say it, it's pretty rare for an NFL teams to draft punters. We, we do seem to see it more frequently now than we used to. I, I don't know if I'm confident enough to, to say that he'll get drafted just because it's such a weird process. He will absolutely kick in the NFL. He's special enough, though. It, it wouldn't shock me. It definitely, it definitely wouldn't shock me. We'll say it. We'll, we'll we'll go out on record, and we'll say that they're gonna they're gonna run. He's gonna get drafted when it's all said and done. Sorry, I got tongue tied trying to pull up this Air Force score here. Um, pulling up more questions. Go ahead and if you guys want to comment some as well, I can gladly answer them. Um, <laughs> couple people bringing up the the bulletin board material and that's what i'm actually going to close with so i don't want to talk about that just yet um another dante Wright question curious if anyone shoved montez's shoe into his own mouth what bowl are we going to though that is from the show csu i can't pronounce your handle so that's what i'm going to go with obviously you got to make a bowl right now my money would be on the new mexico bowl or the arizona bowl would probably be what make the most sense. Um, and then off of that, we have a question from my buddy, Nate Haas, the owner of crazy Carl's. He says, what are the most winnable games for CSU to make a bowl? Looking at the schedule right now, I would say it's Utah state and Wyoming, despite being on the road. It's actually, it's really, it's all your road games remaining. It's Utah state, it's Wyoming and it's Hawaii. You know, you got air force, Nevada and Boise state at home. I think most likely you go two and one on the road, which means you're going to have to win one of those three home games. What happened to USU and UNLV? Uh, U- USU pulled away late. UNLV, they blew another one. And, and I feel for the Rebels. They're, they're 0-12 in the Marcus Arroyo arrow now. They had a chance to beat Fresno State. They had a chance to beat Utah State today. They haven't been able to do it. I hope they just get a win this year. <laughs> it's really rough. Really rough. It's unfortunate CSU doesn't play UNLV because that that would be ugly. That, that would be really ugly. It's also, you know, if every team that CSU plays just has a backup quarterback, that that would work out really well as as well. You know, it's worked out pretty good. Uh, we got a question from Mike Flick. Why is the red zone offense so bad? Why is their best player never considered in there? So that's a two part question. We'll start. Why is the red zone offense so bad? There's a lot that goes into this. Uh, I, I would say part of it is, and this is a little bit of an assumption, I'd have to kind of look at the numbers to to back it up. CSU's been most effective with like some of those stretch runs, sweeps, uh, off tackle stuff, counters, just like straight, you know, halfback draws. I mean, other than San Jose State where Jalen Thomas especially was just gashing them, they're not really like a run it up the gut type team. Like I think they're better at running the football when they have a little bit more space to work with. And obviously when you, when you go in the red zone, all of that goes away on top of that. Although Todd Santeo has been significantly improved, like he's not the most accurate guy in the world. Obviously he's not a guy that's going to pick you apart. The windows get tighter. So I think just naturally the play calling has been a little bit more conservative down in that part of the field for CSU. Now, second part of that question, why isn't Trey McBride getting more red zone looks? The defense is really keying in on him. I mean, we saw the Rams try and take a shot to him at the end of the first half there before they settled for the field goal. If I'm a defensive coordinator, like I'm like, you're beating me with anyone but McBride in that situation. I'll triple him if I have to. You know, just I'm going to make you beat me with literally anyone else. Now, I'm not trying to make excuses. Like at the end of the day, the red zone execution, it just has to be better. You're, you're scoring points and, and you're capitalizing with field goals and that's all great. You're not turning the football over. 
but you got to score more touchdowns. And so I just want to make that clear, you know, like I'm, I'm not making excuses for it, but I also don't think it's a situation where it's just like, they just suck or they don't have talent or it's, why is this? It's, it's a couple of different factors that are kind of working together. But again, they just got to find some more consistency there, especially because, you know, Air Force, they're scoring a lot of points this year. Boise State, they're struggling. Their offensive line's a little bit suspect, and I have some questions about that defense, but they can stretch the field on you. They can score in a hurry. So, like I said, there, there's probably going to be a game this year where that really comes back to to bite you if you're not able to figure it out a little bit more. But at this point, you're in position to to control your own fate, and that's just what you wanted. You know, you wanted to survive this weekend. A little bit of a trap matchup, but you do your thing. And uh, I, I think CSU fans should really be stoked, despite the fact that, you know, there's some little things you can nitpick. They missed a couple of shot plays. There were way too many penalties. If this was a closer game, that could have definitely come back and hurt them. I mean, UNM, they, they got more yardage from CSU penalties than their offense was able to move the football. So that's a problem. But I just, the intensity, the consistency, the decision-making, the execution on both sides of the football, it's, it's really encouraging. Um, but my, my last call here, and this is just going to be my final thoughts for we, before we go, thank you to everybody that's been on the show tonight. We will be back to having guests in the future. Had a little bit of a, a scheduling slip up today. Our, our guests kind of bailed at the last second. It's okay though. This has been a lot of fun. My last call though, I just, I want to talk about the bulletin board material. It was the first thing that Scott Patchen brought up post game. David Bailey mentioned it as well. This young freshman quarterback for New Mexico, I don't dislike that he was confident. I mean, you don't want him to sit there and be like, we're going to lose or something like that. But to go out and be that bold with your statement, especially when you consider what CSU has done in the trenches, how good that front seven has been, for him to just come out and be like, we're going to blow these guys out. That was that was a teaching moment. And and I know that he played in the Snoop Dogg League. I know he, you know, he thinks he's hot shit and all that, and he's been in the moment, but he he was writing checks that his ass could not cash. And the Rams humbled him real quickly tonight. And that was fun to see. Like, I'm glad that the CSU players postgame came out and they said, You want to know what? It pissed us off that they said that because they could have done the coy thing, you know, the football speak, you know, be polite and just no, you know, we, we, don't, we don't get it too into that. But it's human. It's natural. When someone talks trash, you're going to want to be able to respond. And that's what the Rams did. They came out. It was tight early. Like I said, this game tends to be a three-point game or a blowout. But they stepped on the throat. They executed when they needed to most. They took care of business. Now you're in the driver's seat. Now you have a very winnable game at Utah State. It's a tough game. One of the more tough places to play. Maverick Stadium is a cool atmosphere. If you can get out there, I highly recommend it. Beautiful view. The students are right down on top of the field. It's real intense atmosphere. They've got good fans as well. Um, but I'm just so impressed with the resiliency of this group, with the fight that they've displayed over the last month to be able to dig themselves out of this hole and put themselves in a position to be relevant in Mountain West play is is awesome. And we had a comment from Nicholas Toffelmeyer there, you know, a few moments ago, just enjoy the moment. I, I totally agree. Like if you cannot appreciate what's happened over these last four months or four, four months, four games, what's the point, man? Like it's again, it's not perfect, but you're winning. And this is what it's all about. This is a really fun team. I mean, they've just got some personalities. They've got some ballers too. I mean, Trey McBride, Scott Patchen, Daquan Jackson, I, I didn't mention him in Bruce for you, and that was a big oversight on on my part. He just continues to make plays. Had a fumble recovery today, remains the heartbeat of this defense. Like, I'm I'm stoked. I genuinely think that they are, they are going to reach a bowl game, and that would have been an absolutely wild thing to say after the Vanderbilt game. And I know that my biggest harshest critics, the people that hate that I try and stay positive. We're coming for my neck that night, but I keep receipts too, homie. So we will come back to it as the season goes on. This Rams team fight on absolutely love what we saw tonight. You know, again, wasn't perfect, but it was exactly what they needed to do on the road. You know, it's not like you're in a 
atmosphere like Iowa where there's so much energy that it's just naturally going to get you to go. I mean, that was kind of a game where CSU, it was on them to take care of business. You know, that's why I said it was a total trap game. And they whooped. They whooped 36 to 7. And I really just think that playing that difficult non-conference schedule, as frustrating as the one in three start was, I think it shaped this team. I think they're battle tested. I think they know what they do well. I think that they try and lean into that. And I think there's a there's a real opportunity for this team to kind of surprise some people down the stretch. Hopefully they're able to do it. You know, keep up with all things we are doing over at DNVR. Again, thank you to everybody that is tuned in tonight. Uh, it's more fun when I have a co-host, but you know, I, then I don't have to just stare at my ugly mug the whole time while I do this. It makes me feel a little bit weird. You know, what do I do with my hands? But this this was a lot of fun, and I, I'm just so appreciative of the DNVR Rams community. I'm appreciative of my man Yahir producing this show as he always does. Just absolutely kills it. Always has the graphics ready to go. Smooth transitions, and he's just a good dude. Uh, I'm Justin Michael. This is DNVR Rams Late Night presented by Chevalier Mortgage. Thank you so, so much for everybody that tuned in. We will be back next week, as we always are, two hours after the game ends. Have a good night. Enjoy that Rams dub.